So um, let's get started. Um, uh, as uh, Klaus mentioned, uh, some of you may know me through uh, the work I did uh, with uh, Clank Power Tools in bringing um, um, Clank tooling and uh, abil the ability to leverage LV LLVM infrastructure on Windows uh, from within uh, the environment of uh, Visual Studio IDE and to leverage the power of uh, Clank tooling to refactor code at scale. Uh, and yeah, I've been working on Advancing Star for uh, way too many years, um, over 16, I think by now. So um, do feel free to ask questions during the presentation. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye on, 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 the, on the questions. And uh, I think Klaus may, may jump in and uh, read some questions uh, if you have them. Uh, if not, uh, don't worry. Um, we can handle this at the end as well or uh, in the after talk uh, Zoom uh, chat. So um, I do have slides number, so it's easy to uh, note out something if you, if, you have any, if you have any questions. So spooky action at a distance, what's that about? Uh, I, I, I think uh, more than a few people asked about the title. Uh, so I, I, I think I, I, I need to be more explicit about this. Um, it all, uh, comes from um, entangled particles and uh, Einstein's famous quote uh, of uh, related to quantum entanglement of uh, particles and the the uh, inexplicable uh, link between uh, them even at great distances. Um, so I think um, uh, more suited alternative title for this presentation would be revisiting observers, but I, I found that to be too boring. Or why not uh, subscribe uh, to an observer? Uh, so I'll, I think I'll, I'll have to address the, the elephant in the room here and say that um, uh, although very colloquial uh, by now, I really hate the term design patterns. Um, and the, the reason I hate it, it's not, uh, um, it, it's not that uh, I, I don't find them useful and I don't find it useful to uh, have a, a common uh, vocabulary to, to talk about uh, various uh, idioms. Rather, uh, I hate the fact that it implies that there are universally applicable solutions to some uh, code scenarios. And uh, I, I, don't, I dislike when, when people blindly follow uh, a bunch of set of rules or templates uh, as if following recipes for uh, cooking. And um, I think uh, although patterns uh, are valuable in, 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 in conveying uniformity and a common uh, vocabulary for us to discuss matters and identify idioms, I think uh, each situation is um, best associated with a unique solution. So um, uh, there, there is value in uh, identifying what makes a particular instance of an idiom uh, special rather than uh, a template. So uh, there is value in uniform code structure throughout the project. I, I won't deny that. So uh, recognizing something like uh, an, an observer or recognizing a, a visitor or a command or a factory pattern, it, it, it's or delegate. Uh, it's useful to recognize these constructs. Uh, and um, it, it conveys uh, some kind of bearing when navigating an unknown uh, part of the code or um, some kind of legacy code base that uh, we might inherit. So uh, this topic is not to be discarded just yet. Um, um, everybody, I think, uh, has this book in mind when, when mentioning design patterns. Uh, it's a classic, uh, of course, uh, but I find it too formal and dry. And I, I've, I've been, I, have, I have, I have yet to find uh, people that uh, tell me that uh, they, they managed to successfully learn and apply a pattern uh, um, just by reading this book and the examples within, and of course the U UML diagrams. Uh, I, I would recommend, uh, if you're interested in, in approaching this um, uh, more systematically, like uh, using a, a study material, like a book, I would recommend this book by uh, Bob Nystrom, uh, Game Programming Patterns. I find it uh, much more um, applied, much more practical, uh, I find the examples uh, much more compelling and easier to, to, to grasp. 
So as an alternative, if you find the, the classic uh, too dry, I would recommend that you pick this one up. Um, and of course, uh, I have to plug uh, uh, our wonderful host here. Um, uh, um, Klaus had a, a related presentation uh, just recently at CPPCon uh, this year uh, on design patterns in general and demystifying some aspects about uh, design patterns, uh, facts and misconceptions uh, and misunderstandings about uh, how they should be used in particular and uh, how you can um, separate facts from um, myths and um, being able to identify common idioms and, and deconstruct these, these uh, idioms and, and be able to leverage them in your code. So. I do recommend I've put the link there. Uh, I, I don't think the talk is listed officially, but the link does work. Uh, it's a private video um, on YouTube for now. So in terms of uh, inspectable properties of objects, um, I think um, this might be the first thing that comes to mind for many of you. Um, what, re what really did we learn from uh, so many years of uh, object-oriented influence and from other languages uh, and for, from uh, very popular frameworks uh, like Qt, for example? Uh, can we leverage uh, these bar borrowed techniques in a value-oriented context? Uh, do all these techniques actually fit uh, with C++? Or do we have to think about special considerations and uh, maybe identify things that don't work so well, are not uh, very well suited for C++ uh, uh, code bases. So uh, I think we'll, we'll have to cover um, some of these topics and uh, we'll try to revisit the observer patterns from first principles, uh, from theory uh, to uh, code, sa uh, code samples and um, like I said, uh, right from the premise, um, I'm not going to uh, offer a solution here. I'm not going to offer the, the magical implementation or the canonical implementation of an observer pattern because I don't think there is one. Uh, uh, rather, we're going to examine uh, trade-offs. We're going to examine um, some scenarios. Uh, we're going to see some pitfalls. Uh, uh, I'm going to try to show some uh, good usages of the observer pattern and um, um, maybe uh, draw your attention to some of the potential issues that uh, might arise and that you may not be aware of. So uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I wouldn't say that uh, anything, any material that I would present would be uh, controversial, but uh, some of it might be surprising to some of you. Observers are everywhere. Um, think about uh, model view controller, think about uh, MVVM frameworks, uh, model view view model, uh, about the Qt uh, signal slot mechanism. Uh, I think that's a, a big one uh, that uh, people might be aware of. But uh, it's not just about GUIs and uh, the interaction between GUIs and models. Uh, usually uh, that's the canon uh, canonical uh, uh, application for such a pattern, uh, linking loosely, coupling uh, the model uh, with a graphical user interface uh, in some framework that we have to work with. Uh, but this pattern is uh, also uh, well suited for uh, low coupling between model and model parts and connecting uh, remote parts uh, of the model of the, the application through some kind of um, uh, informal protocol. So we'll see uh, some of some examples like that. Um, just uh, trying to set a bit of uh, vocabulary here so we don't uh, confuse ourselves with because uh, we're dealing with pretty ordinary uh, English nouns. Um, I, I would denote this uh, as being a, a show with actors and actions. Uh, so the actor or the subject uh, is the the entity that triggers uh, actions and observers are the ones that observe uh, the actions of these actors. So um, um, in the, the, the subject uh, just knows that 
it has some observers and it has a means of notifying these observers, but it doesn't know, uh, a subject doesn't know the, the concrete type of, of a particular observer and the outcome of these actions. So uh, we'll see how this uh, will affect uh, certain situations uh, for uh, for such actors uh, when particular actions uh, are reacted to in, in, in some way that, that might be um, destructive. So uh, it does offer a, a low coupling mechanism uh, as opposed to something more formal like a protocol or a direct interface uh, between uh, two entities. Uh, so the, the coupling is, is, is lower uh, but uh, most problems uh, that uh, arise from uh, high coupling can occur in, in these situations as well, especially if we're talking about um, uh, observers that um, uh, try to push the envelope in, in, in what they do, in the matter in, in which they register or unregister, or uh, in the actions that they uh, perform uh, in the callbacks for these notifications. So we'll see uh, more on this. Uh, the model uh, conceptually is like tuning in, in a particular to a particular radio station. So um, um, yeah, but I have something here. Uh, never mind. Um, so we're looking. Basically, we're tuning in to see remote objects. Uh, that that's what we're trying to achieve uh, using this uh, this idiom. So uh, that's why spooky action at a distance uh, inspect properties of these remote objects. Uh, in this example, we have uh, uh, a setter here, and we're trying to um, notify observers whenever uh, this uh, uh, private field uh, is changed somehow. So uh, when something in in this payload some some kind of uh, salient data actually changes. Uh, we want to notify observers that might be interested uh, that this invariant changed. Um, so um, we have to talk about subscription now because uh, observers are not magically uh, enlisted uh, for a particular uh, actor. Uh, we have to register them somehow. So. Uh, Intuitively, we, we think uh, order might be relevant, uh, but in, in, in what way? So observers uh, are added in a certain order because of the timeline in, in, in which uh, we work with. Uh, so within the, the application lifecycle, different entities uh, might register for a particular uh, actor, a particular widget here. So do they respond in the same order? Does the order really matter? Uh, so uh, we have to uh, think about that. And we have to, um, again, consider if this is a desirable uh, trait for how this mechanism or this communication works. Uh, we'll, we'll have to see if this is uh, something that uh, is, uh, is really desired for a particular uh, use case. Um, so let's start simple. Um, add observer. Uh, imagine we have an, an observer interface uh, that ob observers conform to, and we just push back uh, uh, this observer. Uh, and we, again, we don't know the exact type of the observer, just the protocol that we use to interact with it. Uh, sounds too simple, right? Um, and what if what if we try to add the same observer twice? That might happen by, by mistake. And then we have to protect it against that. So we have to look up this observer and uh, add it if it's not already there. Uh, again, a uh, few questions pop up. Do we want to allow an observer to subscribe more than once? Uh, it's not always uh, a clear cut answer. Um, intuitively, uh, one might argue that, uh, of course, we don't want an observer to register more than once because it might get duplicated notifications uh, for certain events. Um, but there might be scenarios where uh, this makes sense. 
or uh, uh, scenarios where we actually cannot control this behavior. So th there might be uh, nested actions uh, where a, a particular um, observer might, might be oversubscribed and it's valid to receive uh, multiple notifications from the same uh, from the same actor. So it's not always a clear cut answer. Most scenarios, uh, people tend to protect against multiple subscription, uh, but but I've seen uh, compelling situations where um, uh, registering a, an observer more than once um, makes sense. Again, uh, talking about uh, unique situations with um, best suited uh, unique solutions. Uh, you cannot always uh, generalize. Uh, so uh, when we oversubscribed, uh, oversubscribed, do we do we expect to be called uh, multiple times for the same event? Probably. So um, let's see. Um, what about local reasoning? Because uh, all this uh, talk about uh, spooky action at the distance uh, makes us makes us think that uh, we, we're never in control and we're interacting with uh, objects that are not uh, close to, to where the action is triggered. And you have like a ripple effect where an observer might react and changes something and that triggers another uh, an event, another notification and so on. And uh, you can easily uh, end up with a ripple effect and where you have like a, a very distant uh, entity reacting to something that happened uh, and you might not expect it. So yeah, that's uh, a, a mental uh, model overhead there. Uh, but you, we also have to think about local reasoning. Uh, lo and by local, I mean uh, at a function level or a class level. So uh, let's say uh, we have, uh, we're trying to implement some functionality in this function. And for this uh, functionality, we need to, to be registered for the duration uh, of this uh, action. We need to be registered as an observer for um, a particular uh, actor. And uh, um, reacting to, to something that happens, uh, a property change or anything uh, might happen uh, in, a, uh, in, in some uh, well-defined uh, a method or maybe in you know, a lambda function, something. Uh, so the implementation is irrelevant. Uh, the important bit is that uh, after we're done, we expect that we no longer need to, to listen for this event because we're done. Uh, but uh, again, we're doing local reasoning uh, for these functions. So we, we actually don't know from the interface that we set up, we don't know if uh, we were the first ones to register uh, this, to register this as an observer for ob ob object. And uh, if we remove uh, this observer, uh, does the observer implementation support oversubscribing or not? If the, the implementation supports oversubscribing, then adding and removing makes sense. It will work. It might affect the order depending on, on how the container is used, but uh, you, you have some kind of symmetry. You, you, you oversubscribe you, and you unsubscribe. And the, if there is any other previous registration, uh, uh, it just remains in place. Uh, but if the implementation doesn't support oversubscribing, then this might, uh, as it's uh, shown here, might be dangerous because you might remove uh, an observer that uh, uh, needs to remain uh, there in the, in the list observers. So uh, you can wrap this up uh, in, a, in a, an RAI pattern uh, to just to make sure that you do the, the, the unsubscribing. Um, and and in, in this way, you can actually manage uh, to see if uh, this local part was the one that actually subscribed the observer. So uh, if you design the, the add observer uh, uh, method, 
and the, the interface uh, gives you the information if the the observer was added the first time or if it was already there. You can, uh, using an, an object, you can keep track of this information and upon destruction, choose whether to uh, unsubscribe this observer or not. So in some situations, uh, this might work out okay, uh, using a, a pattern uh, somewhat similar to this. Uh, but again, uh, it's it's not always the case that it's easy to to reason about such, such situations. So local reasoning is sometimes difficult uh, when we're talking about observers. Um, so um, uh, yeah, we can signal the the caller if the registration was successful. For example, uh, return here uh, through a boolean value uh, uh, to note if we managed to add this observer or if it was already there. So um, adding an observer more than once, um, we, accept, we expect usually, we expect the observer to be called twice for the same event. Uh, so uh, local reasoning is about restricted lifetime. So you have to uh, think about the, uh, what happens locally uh, while I'm doing a particular uh, action what happens uh, if, for the particular duration, I want to be observing uh, uh, an object? Uh, it's somewhat similar to uh, local locking in a multi-threaded environment, uh, where uh, you might not always uh, be aware if uh, some something else outside that uh, that local scope that you try to reason about is actually holding the same lock. So. Um, in, in some ways, uh, I think they're similar in the difficulty of the mental model of uh, reasoning locally about such constructs. And I'm going to uh, get back to uh, uh, multi-threading again. Uh, OK. Um, re unsubscribing, removing observer not in the list. Um, again, uh, sounds like a fairly trivial uh, situation. We just have to look it up, and if we find it, erase it. But for the multiple registration scenario, what if we remove the wrong instance? So uh, here we're, we're using a find. And if we're re really sensitive to the order of notifications, then we might remove a duplicated observer. But we might not remove the one that we intended. So if we, if you, if we think that we register uh, the, the same observer, uh, let's say at uh, index three in the list of observers for this actor. And later on, uh, some local function registers the same observer at uh, index 15. Uh, then uh, this implementation as it stands uh, will we'll find the first occurrence and remove the first occurrence and leave the one that is further along the notification chain. So. If we're sensitive to the order of notification between different components that react to the same event, uh, so we have different might have different components in the system reacting to the same event, then uh, removing a duplicate observer in this manner uh, might cause these notifications to uh, come out of order the next time. So um, in general, it's it's not okay to be sensitive to such uh, order of events, but in reality, um, uh, you might very well be. And I've been burned before. So um, removing all instances of this observer. So multiple registration, we might choose an implementation that uh, tries to remove all instances. Uh, so here, a uh, classic uh, erase remove idiom here. Um, that might make sense for a particular application scenarios. And it certainly uh, <laughs> gets rid of the problem with uh, um, wrong sequencing of observers and uh, subsequent uh, event notifications. But again, uh, it, not, it might not be uh, the desired implementation for particular scenarios that you, you might be interested in. Uh, but it's something that uh, we have to keep in mind. Uh, yes, and then a simplification here would be to use the, the safer um, C++ and the sim and simpler uh, C++ 20 um, erase uh, function uh, so that we don't have to uh, do the, the dance with uh, the remove algorithm and then the erase on iterators. Um, okay. 
So thinking, thinking about uh, the, the sequencing of the notifications and, 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 and if we think about if we're sensitive to uh, uh, event notifications coming in a particular order or priority, priorities, then <clears throat> um, we will have to uh, think about uh, how the registration uh, process would look like. For example, here, uh, I've chosen to insert new observers at the beginning of the notification uh, chain. So uh, does this make sense uh, for uh, my, my application scenario in a particular, uh, uh, in a particular um, implementation rather than uh, pushing back? Um, do we need to uh, build priority buckets for observers? Um, uh, this might make sense uh, for some situations. Uh, uh, I, I really uh, did encounter situations where uh, two or more uh, observer rings uh, of different priorities uh, made sense uh, in order to group uh, entities based on priorities of being notified. So rather than uh, particular entities in different priority groups stepping over each other uh, in terms of uh, which one gets to register first and sub uh, subsequently uh, notified first, uh, it, it might be uh, a valid scenario to actually build clusters of priorities uh, where you can group together uh, um, entities based on uh, their priority in being notified by certain events from the same actor, of course. Um, uh, yeah, you might have the situation of uh, the, the interface might look like this, where you actually supply the priority and it gets uh, shoved into the appropriate uh, group there, the appropriate uh, bucket. Uh, but you might, by mistake, you might register the same observers, the same observer with uh, different priorities. So uh, you, we actually have to think about making sure we do checks for this as well, because it might happen by mistake. Um, so, uh, when something happens, we have a, yeah. Do so have... There, there is a question just, yep. um, if, if you are ready to handle it. Sure. So, um, would it make sense to count the registration? So instead of storing a pointer multiple times, does it make sense to just, well, store a count for every pointer, count the number of registrations? Um, what's your, what's your take on that? Uh, th that might be a valid approach, but it doesn't take care of the ordering issue uh, mm -hmm. be because, again, uh, you're faced with the same problem. Uh, so uh, you might not store the multiple pointers in the structure. You might have like a, a, some kind of uh, uh, account structure or associative st structure yeah. there, but yeah. it doesn't solve the, the ordering issue. And uh, again, uh, it really boils down to uh, what you need. So, um, I, I, I see count as a uh, as an, a possibility of implementing such a thing, but I don't mm -hmm. see it solving the problem of uh, yeah. ordering. Okay. So, Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, uh, if we think about the the, the broadcast uh, part, uh, let's say something happens and we need to notify observers, uh, then we uh, let's say we have. Uh, um, an action here that says widget changed, something changed. We don't know what. Um, we can always uh, uh, pass the, the the sender, and this is a usual way of handling it and passing the sender uh, as an argument to this notification, so the the observer can inspect what happened. Um, but it's not the the only re recipe in the book. So. Um, we traverse the observers in order, and we call this uh, uh, this action, and observers re will react. And on the other side, let's say we have an, some observer that tunes in to this action and receives uh, this uh, callback, uh, in, basically implementing the protocol uh, that we have in place, and implements widget changed and receives the sender uh, uh, and can inspect the can react in some way and query the actor for what new state or what have you. Pretty classic uh, so far. But uh, what, uh, what happens if we have a situation where an observer wants to unregister? 
And here we have to uh, pause and ask ourselves, uh, who does who who needs to do the the subscribing and unsubscribing business? Who needs to take care of the registration process? Because so far we have uh, two uh, two categories of players. We have actors, and we have observers, and. Uh, we talked about these two kinds of entities, but uh, do the ob- uh, do the observer itself will register itself as an observer for a particular actor? Will it unregister itself? Do we have a, a third party entity that will do this registration for the uh, observer object that will say, okay, this observer object, I'm going to register uh, it uh, to observe um, this particular actor. Uh, who does the registration and uh, m- most importantly, who does the unregistration? Uh, there are scenarios where uh, an, an observer wants to remove itself after receiving a notification. I've seen this uh, quite a few times and I've seen reasonable explanations for choosing this particular pattern. So uh, the observer registers itself, let's say, for a particular action and it wants to react just once. So uh, after a particular action happens, uh, it will want to uh, unregister itself. So uh, because it doesn't care about future such events. Um, and yeah, it might seem, str- might seem strange, but I've seen reasonable explanations for, <laughs> for such uh, scenarios. So uh, what's wrong with this? Let's see. Uh, as we've seen, uh, when a, when a particular event happens in the actor, the actor basically traverses its list of obs- registered observers and calls that corresponding uh, action method, the classical signal slot. Uh, so on the other side, some observer that tunes into this notification of which it changed from this particular actor will react in some way and then issue this remove observer because uh, this observer doesn't care about this event, about a widget being changed anymore. This in turn, remove observer, like we've seen previously, will call some kind of erase uh, because it wants to remove this observer from the list of observers. And we immediately spot a problem here because uh, as we iterate this uh, uh, observer's vector, in the implementations we've chosen. Uh, during it, uh, the iteration, we actually modify this container as a reaction to removing the observer. So definitely not good. What can we do about it? Uh, well, there's a, an almost classical uh, thing here of uh, planting uh, zombie cells or zombie values uh, or m- putting some kind of uh, sentinel uh, values there. Do we have uh, more questions, Klaus? So there is a question in the chat. Sorry to interrupt. It's, no, it's pretty I, interesting right now. I love it. Um, <laughs> there is a question. Um, uh, I just read it. In some cases, it might not be even possible to know if an observer is already registered. For example, if there's no compar- comparator available. So it's more a statement than a, a question, but I think this is something you might comment on. Uh, yeah, I do have a, a comment on that. Um, somehow, uh, up until this point, I assumed that uh, observer identity is based on object identity. Mm-hmm. So I never mentioned uh, uh, type regularity. Uh, I never mentioned of comparing observers uh, by equivalence or, or by equality. Uh, when, when I meant uh, the same observer, I actually meant its identity in terms of uh, address, like the same instance of, of an observer. Uh, talking about equivalent observers or observers that are considered equal in terms of uh, uh, observable behavior or in terms of uh, what they can do, um, the implementation might change, uh, obviously. But I, I, I just... Uh, um, uh, went for the most obvious and most uh, simple case of actually referring to uh, identical objects uh, and checking the address of the of the observer through the i observer interface here. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Perfect. 
Sorry for the interruption. No, no, I, I, I'm, I'm really happy when people have questions or comments because it gives me a chance to drink some more water <laughs> while you read the question. Because uh, otherwise I, I will go uh, un uninterrupted. Okay, so uh, if we want to solve the problem with the erase uh, that was happening here uh, when uh, some observer wants to deregister itself after uh, take, uh, reacting in some way, uh, there's a pretty classical uh, idiom here of planting sentinel values or uh, zombie values uh, in, 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 in the array, in the container. So in this situation, we can easily uh, uh, put uh, null pointers there because we keep pointers to uh, these uh, observers through uh, their polymorphic interface, through the, the interface. And we can plant null, null pointers there and we don't alter the, the vector. So we just plant these zombie values, and we don't, don't, we don't change the size of the vector. We don't compact in any way. And uh, we have to modify slightly the notification function and make sure it only notifies uh, non-zombie observers. So um, yeah. And we need to do the cleanup, because basically we, we, what we did by planting these zombie values, we deferred the cleanup operation so that we can do it after the iteration finishes. So we, so we don't corrupt the vector. Uh, so after the, the for loop uh, has ended in notifying all observers, then we can do the compacting, the cleanup, and el el eliminate all these zombie values uh, that uh, uh, we have in, in, in the observer array. So that solves this problem, but there are some more. <laughs> uh, if we think about registration, uh, um, and again, I, I alluded to this earlier in the um, when I talked about local reasoning and, and adding uh, oversubscribing, recursive add an observer is, uh, has pretty much the same problem. Um, it, it's more, from my experience, it's more rare in practice, but it can happen. Um, now, uh, if we're talking about observers, um, sometimes we have to deal with uh, big objects or, or objects that have a long lifetime uh, in the span of uh, a particular component or application so uh, but sometimes you have uh, very small objects or very short lived objects and uh, what i found uh, in uh, in dealing with uh, these kinds of uh, objects is that uh, the same recipes don't hold when dealing with uh, short lived objects or uh, with uh, very small objects. Let's say we have um, uh, very small objects and we have many of them. We have thousands, millions of such small objects. And uh, for very short bursts of, uh, of their lifetime, they might need to observe something and react in some, in some way to some event. Uh, if we have lots of these objects, we cannot really afford for them to actually store a list of observers locally. Because uh, they, be, this being an intrusive design, we actually uh, increase the payload for each such small object. And in, in situations like this, um, um, yeah, and you might have some instances that never have registered observers. So um, you might have lots of these small objects and just some of them in some particular, if some particular conditions occur, uh, might register uh, for a particular observer, for a particular uh, event. Uh, and maybe lots of them will not, will never register uh, because the, uh, and I, when I mean lots of them, I mean instances of this small object type. So uh, if you have conditional registration and you have plenty of instances, uh, you pay the cost of an empty vector, which is not tiny. So uh, what can you do about that? You can use uh, something like a lazy vector uh, where you can uh, fold in the creation of the vector uh, the first time it's needed. So you can uh, leverage uh, something like uh, operator star or operator arrow there and uh, uh, not, a not allocate the vector uh, until it's actually needed. So the first time it's, uh, we actually need to uh, touch uh, this member and dereference it in, in some way by calling a function or, or trying to, to do an operation, then uh, the, the vector will be folded in uh, on first use, uh, hence the, the lazy name there. 
So this uh, turns out to be a, a helpful, a helpful pat, uh, pattern for uh, actually saving some uh, some bytes there. So more questions. I have two more questions. Now, unfortunately, yeah. we have to um, go back a little. Um, so the, the first question is again about um, the registrations. So how about allowing but unifying multiple registrations by storing observers in a set? Uh, yeah, uh, good question. Yeah, um, uh, and it's uh, it's not like I haven't thought about it. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, uh, the problem is uh, it solves the uniqueness uniqueness issue, but it doesn't solve the ordering. So uh, storing them in a set, you no longer have a, a, a predictable order in which notifications are sent. Mm -hmm. And furthermore. Uh, with each uh, new registration, the order will change probably because the, the set will need to be sorted. It's a sorted structure. So uh, it, you don't have um, any determinism in terms of uh, uh, sequencing the, the notifications. Again, I said you, you don't have to rely on a particular order of uh, receiving those notifications in different objects, but uh, sometimes, uh, things break. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I find that um, even a poor solution, uh, when it behaves uh, predictably, <laughs> it's, uh, it's much more uh, tolerable. So uh, people uh, expect things to happen in a particular way, although it's a wrong assumption, it, at least it's uh, uh, consistent. Yeah. <laughs> and the second question? All right. There's even a third, but no. Uh, but the next question is about slide 33. 38. Sure. Okay. Um, so um, Robin Ren is asking, isn't there still a race condition on slide 38 where the star it might become null while notifying? Uh, if we mention race condition, uh, I will address um, threads uh, in a bit. So there, there is so far there is no race condition because I, uh, I assume uh, a single thread of execution. But I will come to threads in a okay, few okay, slides. Okay. Yeah, uh, and yeah, things get complicated. <laughs> it, they, they do indeed. And Honey is asking about lazy vector. So she's asking yeah. if this is a, a custom class type. Uh, it definitely is a custom implementation. But uh, it's something that it can easily be. I don't have code on slide for anything like this. Uh, but it's something that can be. Um, uh, easily coded and i think there are implementations uh, uh, mm -hmm. might be something in boost as well i'm not sure uh, but uh, it, either way it's something that you can easily you know, implement yourself by just uh, providing these uh, operators and doing something similar uh, w when you need to actually create the vector mm -hmm. something like a crazy, um, lazy creation policy um, I, uh, pat uh, uh, this pattern can, it's fairly old. I think the first time I've seen it is in uh, uh, Andre Alexandrescu's book, uh, Modern C++ Design, which is yeah. 20 years old now. <laughs> no longer <Okay>. modern. <laughs> it's still called modern, yeah? And he yeah, yeah. invented a term. <laughs> yeah. All right, so thank you. Uh, so I was, uh... I was here. So, um... Again, uh, going back to lots of small objects, um, in some scenarios uh, where you don't want to uh, uh, have this uh, intrusive uh, design of storing uh, either a vector or a lazy vector in these lots of small objects, uh, uh, someone might argue that a sensible design would be to actually use a, 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 an aside structure, some kind of a separate entity that handles this registration or handles this uh, association between uh, every actor uh, that we, we want to start observing and its list of observers. So again, we have a, 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 a list, a predictable order of uh, notifying observers for each actor, and we store this association, uh, association on the side. Uh, as I uh, very intuitively named here, uh, this would be a global bottleneck, of course. So if you have uh, lots of uh, such registrations and unregistrations, 
uh, of course, you will have a, a huge contention for this uh, structure. So again, it really depends on your use case uh, and, and if this is a good fit for a particular scenario in your application. Uh, but uh, again, this is a, an idiom I've seen uh, used. Oh, yes, and uh, we, we've reached the, the, the scary part, the threads, or I, I, as I like to call them, uh, multi-lane highway to crashes. So, of course, when we talk about threads, we immediately think about, let's put a mutex on that. Uh, but... Um, of course, we can guard each such function, like uh, uh, set if we're uh, widget set if we're implementing like a uh, property observer uh, or uh, add observer, remove observer, notify observer. Each such function can be guarded with su such a heavy bottleneck. Uh, uh, but it's uh, first first of all, uh, it will most certainly kill performance if that matters. Might not matter for you. Uh, uh, but again, you're in trouble because you have recursive add and remove of observers. You could have such such things. Uh, again, going back to one of the first slides when I talked about local reasoning, you might have observers already registered and some function locally registers the same observer because it needs to. And it cannot rely on a precondition that uh, uh, such an observer is already there, already registered. So a function needs to have local reasoning and needs to have established its invariance. And one of its invariants might be to observe some kind of properties change on a remote object. So um, again, recursive add and remove uh, can happen. And of course, uh, if we're talking about mutex, uh, recursive mutex pops in, head, in our heads and it uh, promises to solve all problems, including, including COVID. And uh, if we try to use a recursive mutex here, I, I'm showing a very simplified example of using a, a lock guard with a recursive mutex to protect a, a setter uh, that has a, a property observer. And um, no, it's not bulletproof because uh, you can get in a deadlock situation pretty quickly. Uh, and uh, again, this is nothing specific to um, uh, observers per se. It's a problem uh, specific to recursive mutex. So uh, if you're not careful, and uh, again, it's very easy to get in a situation where you you don't know what you what you're gonna end up with because we're dealing with remote parts, remote entities. You can easily uh, end up in a situation where uh, you deadlock. Uh, recursive mutex is almost, um, um, in my in my experience, is almost uh, always a, a recipe for <laughs> for deadlocking yourself. So, uh, it, on paper, it looks like it might solve the problem. In reality, uh, it might be even worse. Um, what about values? I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, uh, I mentioned that um, uh, some of these patterns uh, might need to be adapted or uh, might not be very suited for uh, a value-oriented world or for the for C++ uh, as, uh, as it encourages uh, value semantics rather than reference semantics. Because so far, uh, I only, only mentioned polymorphic types and interfaces, and it all sounds very Java-like. Uh, although valid C++. Uh, if we're talking about squaring the circle and using uh, such patterns in a value-oriented design, again, uh, going back to uh, one of the questions that were asked earlier, uh, if we're talking about uh, values and not, uh, not uh, references or long-lived objects um, and about uh, if we're talking about values, implicitly we're thinking about short-lived objects and local reasoning more than uh, remote uh, entities that are long-lived or uh, live on the hip, maybe. Uh, and uh, dealing with such scenarios in, a, in, a, in an observer context is uh, definitely unusual. Uh, 
and we have to uh, think about what what it means for registering an object. Uh, if it's uh, how can we deal with um, its lifetime? Uh, will it uh, live or outlive its actor? Uh, can can we count on uh, on on that object to be registered multiple times? What does it mean to be the same object? What does equivalence mean for such an object? Re type regularity and so on. And uh, I think uh, most problems are around uh, object lifetimes, uh, but that's not a problem specific to values per se. Uh, uh, as we're going to see, uh, uh, long-lived objects uh, and heap objects that observe each other uh, can get into uh, memory issues uh, just as well. Uh, but if you're interested in understanding more about uh, using uh, a value um, a strong value-oriented design uh, in your code. I strongly encourage you to to watch this uh, uh, excellent presentation by Juan Pedro Bolivar Puente. I have this uh, link here from the C++ on C edition, uh, um, but there's a similar, uh, a newer version of uh, this presentation uh, even from CPPCon uh, just uh, a month or so ago. And um, uh, Juan Payne uh, deals with uh, shows many more um, uh, idioms of using values and reacting to changes, and um, I'm not going to try to go into that path because uh, it's it's an hour long talk. <laughs> but um, uh, he actually shows uh, very nice examples and very nice graphics um, uh, about using uh, values and inspecting properties of uh, value types and uh, constructing lens-like objects uh, to, to project uh, or to, to um, uh, make it seem like we're uh, modifying objects uh, rather than um, uh, copying projections of those objects through lens-like patterns, uh, much like uh, uh, functional programming, uh, programming languages do. So I strongly encourage you to, to watch this presentation if you haven't seen it uh, yet. It's truly life-changing. Uh, so, uh, going back to threads a little, a little bit and tying into the value semantics, uh, when in doubt, always make copies uh, if you can afford them. So, uh, that will save you problems uh, in, 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 in threads. So, if we're trying to go back to our notify observer functions function, we can um, uh, revert to using a, a, a simple mutex rather than a recursive mutex to save ourselves the, the extra headache uh, and just copy the, the observer pattern while holding this lock. And then uh, when we notify observers, we do it through this copy that we've made. And if we somehow have a recursive registration going on, uh, uh, we avoid issues with, uh, pointer, um, with uh, iterative validation by using indices rather than using um, um, by using uh, iterators. And we do, uh, 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 I would say, almost classic trick of uh, testing the, 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 the copy and calling the, uh, the implementation through the copy of the observer, uh, observer vector there, so that we avoid uh, corrupting this uh, array while iterating it. In, curse, in terms of recursive registration or unregistration. And uh, again, we have to hold the lock while we do the deferred cleanup. Again, we're uh, assuming the pattern of planting those uh, sentinel values. Somebody mentioned earlier about uh, potential race condition uh, when we plant those uh, null pointers and we do the deferred cleanup. Uh, this might be a way to leverage this uh, again. Um, you will have to pause here, and if you're in doubt of how this works, you will have to pause on this slide later uh, when you get the video, or uh, I'll share the slides when you get the slides. You have to pause here and think about how this might work out uh, in correlation with the, the implementation of um, add observer that I've shown in, in a previous slide. So it, it's not easy to grog. Uh, I, th I had to think about it a lot, uh, and it's not bulletproof, by the way. There are scenarios where even this uh, trick won't save you. 
Um, I think a, a premier example of uh, this pattern of uh, deferred deletion uh, is the one that you can uh, see in uh, Qt again. I mentioned Qt earlier uh, as a poster child of ob the observer pattern. Uh, Q object, which is the base of all Qt objects, uh, has a delete later function. And I think uh, I, I won't have the time to go into details and show examples uh, of this, uh, but I do encourage people, uh, even people that are not familiar with Qt or that are not using Qt uh, in, in production, uh, I think it's instructive to, to look at uh, how delete later is, is implemented and the idioms that go along with uh, this function and the, of course, the uh, classical uh, signal slope mechanisms in Qt for uh, uh, GUI model interaction or GUI controller interaction. Uh, so I do encourage you, if you're not familiar with uh, Qt uh, signal slots or, or with Qt delete later mechanism, um, look it up. It's interesting. Uh, in terms of threads and uh, uh, thread safe programming uh, with the observer pattern, uh, I consider this uh, uh, a classic uh, already, uh, a talk by Tony uh, from C++ now, uh, five years ago now. Uh, and uh, Tony goes into uh, lots of detail with all the corner cases that can happen in registering and unregistering and oversubscribing and how you can easily step over yourself and uh, corrupt your data structures. <laughs> while you're sending events and reacting to them. So highly entertaining, very, very um, uh, feels like a very improvised uh, uh, approach. Uh, he basically spends all the time in, 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 in the IDE and uh, tweaks the code uh, and uh, goes through many iterations, uh, all of them wrong, <laughs> uh, trying to find a, a good solution. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a journey. Uh, this uh, presentation, I highly recommend it. Um, so, as a, as a, um, a too long didn't read uh, kind of slide for uh, threads and uh, the observer pattern, basically in a multi-threaded context, it's almost impossible to implement a solid observer pattern. And this is uh, again in sync with uh, Tony's experiments and that um, uh, classic uh, C++ now presentation. Um, in in real code, you can't see the, do the deadlocks until they happen. Uh, in, in toy examples that I can throw on a slide or on toy examples that you can code uh, just to prove a point, uh, it, it, you can almost spot and reason about such deadlocks. In real life, it's not so easy. So um, I will uh, say that um, a rule of thumb, uh, general to, to multi-threaded programming uh, unrelated to observer pattern, is uh, don't hold a lock while calling unknown code. And this, uh, because that unknown code can do everything, anything, and uh, you can easily end up in a deadlock. Uh, and reasoning about observers, uh, you always call unknown code. So your actor, when it notifies its observers and calls the event function of all its observers, that's by definition calling unknown code because you don't know what the observers will do. So it's always a bad idea to hold a lock uh, while notifying the observers because you never know, it gets back to you. So uh, for the observer pattern, our topic at hand, unknown code means observer code. Uh, talking about intrusive design, um, see how I'm on time, okay. Uh, talk about intrusive design, um, uh, you usually don't wanna, have all this mess within us, uh, your uh, actor. So uh, actor implementation in our uh, toy example here, a widget. We want to delegate uh, and encapsulate all this behavior in a, some kind of reusable generic um, uh, class template uh, uh, that handles all this business. So uh, you, you might end up with something similar to uh, inheriting from an actor template here. Um, to, to uh, mo basically hide away all, all these uh, mechanics of the implementation of notifying, uh, registering, unregistering, and everything else. So um, uh, let's see. Yeah, 
uh, I think I'm going to skip this one. OK, I think uh, uh, I have to focus on, on um, uh, this part a bit more. Um, if we're talking about uh, observers, um, we have to talk about optional protocol methods. Uh, this is something that is not encoded in C++ per se. Uh, other programming languages, uh, for example, uh, Objective-C and uh, subsequently Swift, have this baked in, the, the notion of uh, optional protocol methods. Uh, protocols meaning interfaces and uh, optional methods meaning that uh, uh, I might conform to a particular protocol, but um, uh, I'm not required to implement all methods of that protocol. Some of them might be required, some of them might be optional. And uh, this translates to C++ because uh, it's something that uh, it's useful, it's needed in practice sometimes. Uh, in C++ translates into having stub uh, or default implementations, either stub or implementations that actually do something um, meaningful for that event. So uh, if we imagine we have an uh, I stuff observer, where stuff might be, whatever. Um, and we have uh, in, in this interface, uh, we have stuff added, stuff, stuff removed, stuff will change, stuff changed, um, going to sleep, waking up, all kinds of made up events here. Um, then we have uh, an, a default implementation um, so that a, a particular observer that I called here a spectator for an actor, of course, uh, a particular spectator might not care about all these other events. So this is, uh, again, uh, very prevalent in, in practice. Uh, uh, you, you want to avoid uh, boilerplate code uh, and just doing code mechanics. So uh, if this particular spectator uh, doesn't care uh, about any other event uh, aside from going to sleep, so this might be the only event of interest for the spectator, then um, it doesn't, this class doesn't need to implement all those other uh, methods in, in this observer interface. Uh, again, uh, one might argue that um, uh, you should strive for a narrower protocol. So rather than have uh, big protocols with lots of methods, lots of events, uh, you might think about composing uh, and, and, and dividing these uh, events into multiple interfaces, multiple observer interfaces, uh, that's a valid point, uh, uh, but life gets in the way, and sometimes you end up with, with huge interfaces. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and um, now, we, um, uh, with that out of the way, uh, uh, we have to think about observing multiple actors. Let's say we have a spectator observer. Uh, which uh, implements this uh, stuff observer interface, or its default implementation, rather. And we want to observe a particular actor. So we attach to that actor, and we add ourselves. So this, we add ourselves, because, because we are a stuff observer. We add ourselves to that particular actor in, in the list of observer of that particular actor. And we're interested just in this event, going to sleep from that actor. But what if we're interested about the same going to sleep event from another actor, another entity? And by another actor, I don't mean another instance of uh, the actor, another type. I called it here a uh, thespian. So uh, if uh, the same spectator it is interested in um, one or more events, but let's say uh, it's interested just in going to sleep event, uh, but the, it, it wants to know about the same event from two different types, an actor and a thespian. In this situation, we are quickly in trouble because uh, as we register uh, ourselves by this, uh, we register ourselves as an observer for actor and then as an observer for thespian, uh, we're in trouble because uh, as we defined the observer pattern, we have a single function uh, signature to denote this event, and uh, we cannot reuse it. So, which one will uh, will call the event? So, uh, we're immediately in trouble here because uh, we have the same event coming from two different types. Yeah, we cannot 
use use anything like this. So there is a solution. Uh, like uh, any other problem in programming, uh, it can be solved with uh, another level of indirection. Uh, I forgot to put here a link to uh, Phil's website. Okay, <laughs> I have to remove, remember to alter the slide there. So uh, uh, again, uh, a good recipe here uh, in some situation is to use uh, observer proxies, uh, which are a means of uh, looking uh, through a, like a uh, looking for, from from uh, through an indirection, like uh, using a periscope here that I, I, I sh I've shown. So, uh, if we're thinking about building an observer proxy, uh, we have to uh, use a technique here. Again, uh, fairly old technique. Uh, if uh, people recognize this uh, int to type uh, structure, uh, I have uh, news for you. Uh, you've been programming C++ for too many years. Uh, uh, this into type structure is actually from uh, uh, Andre Alexandrescu's Loki library from way back uh, yeah. from the modern C++ uh, programming book. So uh, we can uh, try to use uh, type uh, to use type tags uh, in order to to uh, disambiguate these functions. For example, if we might have multiple uh, instances of uh, going to sleep and we need to uh, disambiguate between uh, different types that want to handle this. So we have a staff observer and each method from uh, our uh, uh, protocol is uh, adorned with an additional type ID aside from its uh, arguments that it might have. And uh, this is the uh, all the interesting uh, uh, bits. This is where the, the magic happens in the proxy, because the proxy is the one that is actual, the, actually the the staff observer. Proxy is the one that conforms to this protocol, and we have a means of supplying uh, 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 identities for different types of observers, and uh, we use this type ID. Uh, which is just a means of converting an, uh, an integer into a, in, into a different type, so that uh, we don't have uh, we don't have we don't use the same type, and we have a means of encoding the receiver type, which is receiver being the, the observer that receives the notification. Uh, and again, here we, we use the stuff observer that we defined uh, on this previous slide. And uh, this again is receive the observer index. So we, we're trying to give unique identities to to these observers. And all this observe the, the all this proxy does because the proxy is a um, staff observer. It will implement uh, the the required uh, protocol methods, and we, it will just uh, delegate uh, this action, this uh, event, to the the underlying ob real observer. That the difference being it it that it will delegate the the event uh, call by calling the the appropriate overload in the observer using the the, the appropriate type ID for this entity. Uh, and I, I've shown here two examples of stuff added and stuff removed. So stuff added from proxy will forward the event handling to the stuff added from the real uh, spectator, uh, but calling it with the overload with the appropriate type ID to disambiguate between the, the multiple overloads. So basically, uh, when calling here stuff added, it will call this method stuff added here with the type ID. And let's see a concrete uh, example. So uh, we need to uh, group this uh, uh, neatly in, in, in a, net, a namespace and say we have a spectator observer proxies namespace. And we define an actor as being a staff observer, the, the first staff observer. And it has a proxy. And the proxy is for the spectator class. Uh, and we have a thespian, which is a, the second staff observer. And we have a thespian proxy for the spectator class, which uh, where the spectator is our class that we've used already uh, as an example of uh, an observer. So the same spectator class that we've used here. So now let's see how it, the new spectator class would look like. 
uh, we inherit from those two uh, proxies, uh, actor and thespian. And now uh, what we have to do is uh, instead of registering ourselves, so previously we did actor ad observer of this and thespian ad observer of this. So instead of registering ourselves, so the spectator as a direct observer, we instead register the proxy objects that we have. We have two proxy objects, one for actor type and one for the thespian type. And we register them as direct observers. And in turn, the proxies will notify us by being linked to this object. So each proxy knows about the spectator, the, the, the observer, the concrete receiver of the message. And in turn, the, the proxy will delegate this notification to us with the appropriate type ID for actor or thespian. So here uh, is the delegation again, I'm showing you it, uh, again, where uh, we, the, the proxy holds a reference to the real observer, the receiver, and it just forwards the, 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 each event, it just forwards each event with the appropriate type tag uh, uh, when receiving it. So this is where it happens. So uh, the, the receiver is the spectator, which is linked. This is where it gets that bound reference to the observer in the constructor. And it just forwards the notification when it receives it directly. And this allows us to have code that looks like this, and it's much more easy to much more easy to, to read and reason about. Uh, where we have, uh, let's say, um, the same event going to sleep, coming from two different entity types, from uh, actor type and from thespian type. Uh, uh, with the same type of parameters because it's the same function from the, the, the interface that we have designed for, from the, the same protocol. And we can handle situations where actors go to sleep or where uh, th when thespians go to sleep. And we can have uh, uh, stuff added or any other uh, protocol method. So we can mix and match and implement just the, 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 the observer interface or the observer protocol methods that we care about from the entity that we care about. So we can easily disambiguate in this manner. So the code is uh, easily readable. You can reason about what happens. And you have, uh, by construction, guarantee that uh, this event is called for the, the right type. So the, the, the construction, by, the, by using the type system, guarantees uh, uh, soundness in terms of the notification reaching the, the appropriate uh, callback. Um, I, I will mention here that uh, the, the staff observer and staff observer proxies, uh, as I've shown them, uh, they are uh, class templates and can be used for any other spectator type uh, because uh, the spectator type is a, a type parameter. And uh, again, can be used for any observed uh, subject actions. Uh, so uh, here we have uh, um, actor and thespian, but any any such subject that conforms to I staff observer interface, so that conforms to the protocol that we deal with, because the protocol is encoding in this class. So uh, then you have you can use these you can use these generic components uh, for any other types of subjects that conform to the same protocol. Uh, and for any other observer class that it is interested in observing events from the same protocol from any other uh, subjects. So um, it's definitely, I, I found that uh, this pattern is uh, 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 pretty useful in, in some situations uh, where you don't want to repeat boilerplate code. So you just want a, a quick way of uh, hooking things up, uh, hooking um, events with observers uh, quickly and safely. Uh, again, it doesn't, it's not a, a universal recipe, it doesn't fit all scenarios, but it saves you some boilerplate in, some, in, in many scenarios. Uh, so, do you have questions? You, yes, I actually have a lot and there's a lot of discussion. Um, I, I'm almost done, so it's okay. <laughs> all right, um, so Robin, you're in. Rabbi Niren has a question about this, these optional protocol methods. So he's asking, yeah. do they go against the Liskov substitution principle? 
so LSP. Uh, so should I do it or not? This is how an interpretation. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna go with the safe answer. It depends. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it really, uh, it really boils down to what you're trying to do with them. Uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 it depends on what kind of protocol are you building. Uh, if you're building a, a, a protocol that uh, it tries to de define some kind of uh, uh, identity uh, for different kinds of types, uh, then uh, yeah, uh, again, in, in combination with, if you're thinking about even more uh, dangerous situations, if you're talking about uh, covariance or contravariance of mm -hmm. uh, functions defined using uh, such uh, interfaces, such protocols, then you can you can easily get yourself in trouble uh, if if you're trying to abuse uh, these these things. Uh, but if you're trying to model something like uh, you, you have a particular set of uh, actions and. Mm -hmm just a, a subset of them makes sense for a particular uh, entity type, then it's just a matter of convenience of saving yourself boilerplate. Think about um, um, first thing that came to mind was, uh, remember the, the exception specifications uh, that, that we had for functions uh, uh, or uh, the, the Java uh, craze from the 2000s of uh, handling uh, a particular function might uh, throw uh, uh, a list of uh, possible exceptions and you have to uh, handle all those scenarios uh, even if you, you you don't care about a particular uh, uh, scenario you just have to write all that boilerplate and uh, i found that the same thing applies for uh, observers uh, you might have a pretty wide contract a pretty wide interface and uh, multiple observers might be interested just by, uh, uh, by just one or two events from that uh, pro wider protocol. And again, uh, you, you can make the argument that the protocol is too wide and you should use more specialized, more narrow uh, contracts for observing those actions. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, again, it, it's a trade-off between... Um, parts of the application where you care about more events or parts of the application where you care about an intersection of events from various protocols. And then you may make things difficult for uh, those types of observers. Um, not a great answer, I, I think, uh, but, I, but I think it boils down to, the, to being practical rather than uh, type correct. So I wouldn't abuse the, the idea of um, uh, optional methods in protocols. It definitely it's not some, something that I would uh, encourage to use <laughs> eagerly. Uh, but in some situations, it, it's just a matter of saving yourself boilerplate where it makes sense. So I, I would definitely not use something like this uh, uh, around uh, API boundaries or around uh, mm -hmm. function yeah. arguments or return values or uh, things like that. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, a, a very convoluted answer, but I, I don't have a, a better one. <laughs> uh, it depends, uh, as you said. Too, too long, too long. Didn't read. Uh, don't abuse this. <laughs> All right. Um, so because because the the inheritance thing was rather complicated, uh, uh, convoluted. Care eleven asks, uh, look as if aggregation would be more suited than inheritance. Uh, I think they're referring to this. So uh, the initial. Um, so it, when you mentioned this, this is when he asked the question. Perhaps he's now satisfied with the or um, with your answer, but perhaps not. Um, I, I don't know. Uh, but do you consider aggregation a solution, or does it have to be inheritance? Uh, I don't know what they're referring to exactly. Okay. Uh, I don't know if they're referring to this slide, or uh... I think it was pretty much in the beginning when we started to talk about these possible, that this overlap, what I call as the Siamese twin problem. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, um, please ask the question again, perhaps a little more specific. Um, or maybe just come into the after talk chat and we can yeah. 
talk some more there. <laughs> Perfect. All right. And then I do have a question. Um, you, you were talking about, about not being intrusive, but then you used the base class. Don't you consider a base class to be intrusive as well? Yes. Uh, again, uh, okay. I was I wasn't referring. To, maybe I chose I poorly chose the the term. Uh, it, it's just using a base class is, yeah, it, it it's it's still intrusive. Uh, what I meant was uh, uh, trying to um, shove away all the mechanics and the boilerplate in in some other part where you don't see it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, mixed up with the, the application logic or the yep. object logic. So, uh, yeah, uh, by definition, it's a, using the base class is an intrusive, yeah, I, I chose poorly the term, is in, it's still an intrusive uh, implementation. Uh, what I I have to figure out a, a different term. What I, what I meant to say is that uh, you want to shove all these mechanics of registering and registering uh, in some other part so that you don't see it in your object uh, when you're dealing with the object specific uh, uh, yep. uh, code. Okay. Perfect yeah. answer. Thank you. Uh, I'll have to choose another term. <laughs> you're right. No problem. All right. Uh, this is it for now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm almost done anyway. So um, uh, trying to uh, tie things up uh, uh, at the end here is that uh, we, we kept mentioning uh, action at a distance, remote parts, local reasoning. Uh, in the end, uh, building such observer networks is a form of global state. And like any other form of global state, uh, there are issues. We've seen some already uh, issues about uh, being able to reason about uh, order of notifications, issues regarding to uh, recursive registration or unregistration, uh, issues around um, uh, um, multiple registration, around uh, object lifetimes and uh, reference semantics and objects that are long lived uh, through the, the application life cycle uh, and objects that might go away uh, and you have to deal with uh, a proper registration and unregistration and uh, problems with threading and um, how easily you can end up in a situation where you deadlock or you corrupt your data structures. Again, because uh, it sometimes it's, it's very difficult to reason about this network of uh, uh, related parts uh, that uh, somehow, somehow interact with each other and uh, you might end up with a ripple effect where you uh, wake up for some uh, event notification in in some entity uh, that might seem totally unobvious uh, how you end up ended up in that situation. I've definitely seen uh, uh, call stacks uh, uh, when landing in a in a breakpoint in a, such an event uh, handler where I've actually uh, uh, I was uh, perplexed to see. Uh, how the execution end up in that particular point uh, through a very long chain uh, of uh, observer actions uh, that uh, in the end reached a particular uh, situation that uh, was unexpected. So uh, global state, is, as always, uh, is uh, problematic to reason about, is difficult. Uh, it's the same reason I dislike shared pointer and building uh, long-lasting and uh, interconnected uh, uh, web of uh, heap objects uh, that uh, might end up uh, uh, with, uh, with cycles or with uh, dependencies and, and building incidental data structures from uh, connecting, too easily connecting such objects uh, and ending, the, ending up in, in disaster sometime or being unable to reason about what happens. Even if things uh, function properly, uh, you might not be able to reason about uh, what's going on. Uh, of course, there are memory management issues. Uh, you might end up with dead subjects or missing observers, and you can easily end up blissfully dangling uh, uh, of the observers that you hold on to. So uh, you always need to be careful with the unregistration process. Yeah, uh, and I'm, I'm going to conclude the this presentation with uh, this uh, famous comical reference that always cracks me up. 
So uh, please do try to avoid to uh, end up with uh, uh, dead actors in your observers. And with that, um, I'm uh, ready for more questions uh, or a lively chat uh, in Zoom afterwards. All right. Thanks a lot for the great talk. Um, there's no more question now. Uh, indeed, we covered all the questions um, in, in the, uh, this last little break. But perfect. Thanks a lot. Um, if you do have still questions, then please ask them right now. Yeah, we, we might have a couple of, uh, we might wait a couple of seconds. Perhaps there is a couple more. Sure. But uh, else, indeed, I just posted a link to our after talk chat. So if you uh, want to ask questions to Victor directly, if you just want to chat about C or listen in, into the discussion, then please feel welcome to join this Zoom meeting. Um, so there's a lot of applause, I see. Or maybe if people want to share their own experiences of using things like that. Uh, yeah. there, I'm sure there are plenty of, uh, of use cases and scenarios that I didn't cover. And I would be curious to, to hear what, uh, what people have done with similar things. Yes. All right. So there's no more questions. Then thanks a lot, Victor. And um, well, hope to see it, a lot of you in the after talk chat. It, so, was a, it was a pleasure to be here. Thanks a lot to you.